Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Butler from Faith Trust Institute. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Back to School, Addressing Gender Violence in Theological Education. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment, but first there's a few technical details. First of all, you should be able to hear me now. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Uh, you should be able to hear me and see the technical information slide on your screen. If you're having problems with the sound, please check that your speakers or headset are plugged in and that your volume is turned up. If you're having technical problems, I recommend exiting the webinar, returning to the link in your email, and trying to connect again. If that doesn't correct the problem, please send me a message using the chat feature on the right side of your screen, and I'll try to help you once we get started. We welcome your questions as you listen to the presentation. We'll hopefully have about 15 minutes at the end to answer as many as possible. Please send your questions anytime during the presentation using the chat feature on the right side panel. I'll hold on to all the questions until the Q&A session after the presentation. The slides you see on your screen during the presentation will be emailed to you as a PDF later this afternoon, so you'll have them as a resource. Lastly, we're recording this webinar to make it available on our website for those who can't join the live session. We welcome those who are listening to the recording. Today's webinar is part of a series of 12 sponsored by the InFaith Community Foundation in 2014 as part of their Ending Family Violence Initiative. InFaith Community Foundation, formerly the Lutheran Community Foundation, has sponsored many previous, previous webinars, which are archived on our website as recordings. I encourage you to check those out. I'll send you a list of future webinars today so you can join us for those. Please visit InFaithFound.org to read more about this series and the other great work that they're doing. We thank them for our sponsorship. We're fortunate to have four accomplished women here today to discuss the role of theological education in understanding, combating, and changing the reality of gender-based violence. Our first presenter will be Reverend Dr. Marie Fortune. Marie M. Fortune is the founder and senior analyst at Faith Trust Institute. She's been central to the ongoing movement with both faith communities and secular advocates in addressing domestic and sexual violence and abuse. She has championed the importance of healthy boundaries, interpreting scripture and sacred text to support the safety and well-being of not only women and children, but families and communities. Her books are read widely and considered foundational references in the field. Audience members, if you have questions, please submit them anytime using the chat box on the right side panel of the screen. And Marie, I am going to turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. We're delighted to have you join us for this uh, conversation. And I'm particularly pleased to have uh, three colleagues uh, join in and discuss a very important issue, I think, at this point in our efforts to end gender-based violence. I want to say a little bit about um, a little historical perspective in terms of theological education. I was a seminary in the 1970s, and I would basically say that at that time uh, I did not receive any training that prepared me for uh, ministry in addressing issues of gender-based violence. I was a student at that time at Yale Divinity School, and I remember returning during the 80s and being in conversation with my ethics professor, Margaret Farley. And uh, she was simply reflecting on the things that uh, her students were telling her when they came back to visit after serving in parish settings. And she was uh, surprised to uh, report that the most common concern that they brought back to her at that point was that they were encountering incest in their parish ministry settings. And that was a piece of new information for her that I think uh, she then incorporated into her teaching, so to better prepare students to address the things that are actually happening uh, in people's lives in their ministry settings. Certainly things in our uh, seminaries have changed uh, since then. And when I visit seminaries now, I'm pleased to um, frequently discover one or maybe two faculty who are in fact beginning to 
address issues of gender-based violence in their teaching. So that's part of what we want to discuss this morning. <clears throat> when I was serving in a parish, there was uh, the experience there of when I would raise issues of sexual or domestic violence with my congregants, um, the response was a nervous uh, looking down at the floor and not wanting to talk about those issues, even though I knew that those issues were important and were ongoing within uh, families within the parish. But I was also at that time working as a rape crisis volunteer and what I found there was sort of the flip side, which was when victims of sexual assault uh, that I was working with as an advocate, if they asked what I did and I told them I was a pastor, then they would immediately want to talk about their faith issues. And the main thing that they conveyed to me was that they were not comfortable going to their faith leader at that time with those issues. Our work here at Faith Trust has focused heavily on training clergy and our goal there is to equip clergy to be part of the solution and not part of the problem in working with the people in their settings of ministry. But unfortunately we still encounter clergy who say that no one ever comes to me with this problem. And uh, I still continue to be amazed at that given how much attention we see in the media in general at this point uh, about sexual and domestic violence and how it is that any faith leader has not stopped and asked him or herself the question, why are my people not coming to me with these problems because these problems must be happening to them as well. When I uh, engage with uh, theological education and that discussion, I'm always doing it from the perspective of preparation for ministry. But I also affirm the need for solid scholarship, particularly in areas of history, sacred text, theology, ethics, pastoral care, and liturgy around issues of gender-based violence. And also the need for research in our academic settings in all of these areas. So that's why I'm invested in this conversation about uh, theological education and its ability to address gender-based violence. And so I've asked three colleagues whose work um, I have uh, had tremendous respect for for many years to reflect on gender-based violence in the context of theological education. And so we're going to begin with, um, and we want to address the, the three questions that you see on your screen. Why is this an important issue to address in theological education? How did it become an important issue in their work? And how does teaching about gender violence in seminary impact congregations and culture? So first up is uh, Rabbi Lisa Gelber. And uh, Lisa has worked at the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is a seminary serving the conservative movement for over a decade and currently serves as the Associate Dean of the Rabbinical School, the Rabbi of the Seminary Synagogue, and Adjunct Lecturer in the Department of Professional and Pastoral Skills. She's also the editor of numerous works on domestic violence in the Jewish community, <clears throat> including A Journey Towards Freedom, a Haggadah for Women Who Have Experienced Domestic Violence. And uh, probably most important to me in my uh, years of knowing Lisa is that she's a former board member of Faith Trust Institute and uh, was a very helpful, supportive uh, board member for a number of years. So it's nice to be in conversation with her today. Lisa? Thanks, Marie, for convening us for such an important conversation. Awareness of and education around gender-based violence is a priority of mine when I return to the seminary because of my experience in the congregational rabbinate, which demonstrated that domestic violence was real out in the world, outside of the ivory tower. Within a year in the field, I was invited to moderate a panel regarding domestic violence. I officiated at a Seder for victims of sexual and domestic violence, and I was involved, as you mentioned, in the creation and publication of a Haggadah, a guidebook used for the Passover Seder. 
It was clear to me from the opening days of my rabbinate that gender-based violence is alive and active in our communities, and that faith leaders, houses of worship, and faithful people have a role to play in acknowledging violence against women, in supporting community members in advocacy work, and in utilizing our voices. As a seminary student, I received absolutely no instruction related to this topic. We did some text study, but there was no relation to domestic violence. I don't even remember the word really being uttered. And so I did, as we say these days, I leaned in and I learned out in the field. This is a systemic issue around which to engage community, and seminary students, I believe, must understand this as they prepare to become spiritual leaders. Growing into spiritual leadership demands embracing the responsibility for creating holy space for the development and nourishment of spiritual lives, one's own and those of our communities. So, in training the students, I believe that they need to engage with the stumbling blocks presented by the tradition. They need to have knowledge, skills, and they need to become reflective practitioners. My students are steeped in the study of text, and of course they need to learn the content of the tradition, and that is very much the culture of this place. But they also need to learn the text with a sense of application, a call to something larger, an invitation to allow the texts, particularly the challenging ones, to touch them. When I reached out to colleagues in thinking about what I would say today, I asked, in what setting did you learn about gender-based violence during rabbinical school? There was one response that stood out for me. And it was, you mean besides just studying text without any awareness of what it means that we're analyzing arguments about rape and abuse? It's not enough just to look at the text and to say that it is holy. It's insufficient and it's irresponsible. We want people within our communities to see their houses of worship and faith traditions as a safe haven, intellectually and spiritually, which means that the spiritual leaders have to have a deep awareness of the tradition. They have to have a sense of how the tradition supports individuals and the challenges that may arise. And they need to talk from a reflective space. If they don't, people will go away. They won't come to our houses of worship. They won't look to us as those who can help bring them strength, bring them healing. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who worked here in the building where I sit right now, taught us some are guilty, all are responsible. And we take that call very, very seriously. The High Holy Days in the Jewish people, which are fast approaching, at that time we speak in the language of community. We confess our wrongdoings and where we've missed the mark in the presence and for the presence of the collective. Again, taking seriously what it means to say some are guilty, all are responsible. Our clergy need to know. We need to be honest about what's going on in the world. We need to engage. We need to live into our authority, our leadership, and our role as truth tellers and change makers. Go to the next slide, please. My wonderful students, they are yearning for deeper learning and skills to raise texts, complicated texts, in community. And they are looking for places to wrestle with their own stories. And they are coming to learn that knowing one's own narrative helps to make room to hold that of someone else. And my colleagues who have expressed gratitude, but honestly, it has not been easy. For years, there was no commitment to long-term focus on gender-based violence as a critical, significant learning for seminary students here where I work. And so we had programs and activities for students from all five of our schools, not merely seminarians. And I do not take away from the importance of those gatherings and that learning. And I'm incredibly grateful for the support we received institutionally from our counseling center and from our office of student life.
but this learning was in no way embedded in a strategic way into our educational system. But I've noticed a shift. We have now a new emphasis on training in pastoral care in an intentional way. And that has invited the incorporation of education regarding violence and the dynamics of trauma in both a required course and an extremely popular elective. And I was delighted when I approached one of the instructors, told him what I was working on, requested the syllabus, and he gladly shared it with me and extended an invitation to me to offer a didactic presentation in his class. You can go to the next slide, please. So what now? When I think about what needs to happen here at JTS, I am drawn to the call to use gender-based violence to examine the text of our tradition. I believe it has to be one of the frames for our students as they think about their work in the world. We need to know what it means to hold these texts, our sacred texts, to have them as our canon, to unpack them with honesty and without apology and to struggle with them. Again, to go back to what I said before, to allow the text to touch their hearts and to motivate them towards change. There is a tradition by those who wear tefillin in the morning. There are the straps and boxes with um, a significant prayer, the Shema, inside of them. We wear on our arms and on our head in the morning for the morning worship service. And in putting those on, Traditionally, one recites a, pa a passage from Hosea. And I know those who stopped saying that text because it felt as though it reflected the rhythm of a coercive relationship. And in conversation with these individuals, there was a sense that they were doing something quite radical. Well, I don't want that to be seen as radical. I want us to be in conversation, to engage in an individual and a, com a communal discernment process, to actually engage the liturgy and say, does this work? Does it not work? Why does it work? How does it not work? And what does that mean for us, for ourselves as we grow in leadership, and especially as we teach others and we learn to build community? I also think that our attention to teens has really been lacking. We haven't paid attention. They are in the midst of developing their identity in so many ways. And they need to think about what their relationships are going to be like. And they need to think in order to know what it means to be in relationship, they have to have a sense of self. And I believe that they have to have that self within the framework of what it means to be created, as we say in Hebrew, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. But most importantly, the words of Pirkei Avot, of the ethics of our fathers, or the ethics of our ancestors, as I like to say, that provides, I think, the values and pillars of this topic. And that is that the world stands on three things, on justice, on truth, and on peace. That's what I want our clergy students to understand. I want them to have accountability for what is right. I want them to speak the truth and to hold others accountable. And I want them to take the lead in creating safe haven, sacred haven, physically and spiritually for all who walk in our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. That's very helpful, and I think positions our discussion very well. And now I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Siwa Okundi, who is originally from Kenya. <clears throat> and her commitment to social justice comes from her in informed activism of her family. She is, by nature, a preacher and is studying um, preaching as the focus of her academic work and is a candidate for practical theology and homiletics and a PhD at Boston University School of Theology. Welcome, Elizabeth. 
Thank you so much. I begin by thanking God for this opportunity, the ones who came before us, our sponsors, and our co-presenters, and you, everyone out there today. Thank you so much for joining us. The question where we begin is, why am I committed to this work? Uh, why do I believe in addressing gender-based violence and theological education? Well, for me, is that wherever I go and wherever I am, women and girls are sharing their stories, and they're sharing them in so many ways, in spoken ways and unspoken ways. And when they talk, they share their stories of pain, of frustration. Some of them can easily express words related to violence, and others do not want to admit that they are being violated because of the stigma around violence against women and girls. And the women who share their stories, they are of different ages and economic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, educational levels. They come from many different countries and many different perspectives. And their stories are so rich and so deep. Take, for example, the university professor who shared with me that she was being stalked by her boyfriend and she was not certain about whether or not she should tell her administration. And if she did so, would she risk her position at work? She did not know what to do. Or take, for example, another woman I encountered who'd been beaten so badly that she required hospitalization. And she worried about her children, what would happen to them, how they would fare in going to court and testifying against their father for what they had witnessed. Or take, for example, the little girl who had been raped and she was afraid to return to her home because the person who raped her lived in the same community. And another woman who came to me, she being a preacher and was being abused by her husband, and he was also a preacher. She was not sure what to do. So in all of these different examples, women and girls are sharing their stories. I had another woman who asked me the question of why was I attending a particular conference and presenting there, and she claimed that violence against women and girls did not exist in her community, and yet she went on and told me that she dreaded going to work each day because her boss constantly humiliated her and made her to feel less than the person she is. And so in each of these cases, women are sharing their stories, and they are happening in ordinary, everyday encounters everywhere I go, whether it's a church, a hospital, a bus, a train, an airplane, a conference, a private home, here in the United States, in Canada, in Israel, in Ghana, in Jamaica, in Kenya, wherever it is that I've traveled, I hear the stories of women and girls. And when I hear these stories, I have to make a decision, what am I going to do? And I make a conscious decision to address gender-based violence. And I do so because of my personhood. I am a woman, um, I've been a girl, when I was younger, of course, and seeing different kinds of things, listening to different kinds of things, I want the world to be a place that is safe for women and for girls. And when I hear the statistics of one in three, one in four women or girls around the world will be abused or violated in her lifetime, those statistics are real because I'm hearing the stories of women and girls. As well, I make this decision because each week finds me in some pulpit uh, here or around the world preaching somewhere. And when I look into the pews, who do I see? Women and girls are the majority. They're everywhere. And I also make this decision because of and through my position as someone who preaches, a preacher. My position allows me an opportunity on a regular basis to be able to speak messages that should be of comfort and of hope and also being able to be critical of those things going on in our world and our society. And the way that I am able to address gender-based violence is where I am. I know that I cannot do everything. I have limitations. And so I have to figure out what is it that I'm able to do. And I'm able to address violence gender-based through my preaching, my teaching, and through supporting others. 
And my approach is what I call the small voice. It's a way of, of listening, listening to the things that are spoken and unspoken, and listening in a different kind of a way, not just hearing, but listening for the things that we may not always see or feel or figure out at first glance, but knowing that there is something deeper happening in our encounters with women and girls. And so I believe that theological education should teach students and leaders to move beyond the comfortable, the easy, and the predictable places, that we should be able to go deeper with our theological education. And in the next slide, the responses. When I go and I make presentations about preaching, how to preach about gender-based violence, uh, because uh, as I mentioned, I start from where I am as a preacher and as someone who is in the academic world. And so when I, I give presentations about how to preach on violence against women and girls, um, students are encouraged. They're listening and they are encouraged. And a male student said, what touched me most about your lecture is that we must be bold when we preach about issues of injustice. Administrators, I get mixed reviews. Some of them are in denial. They are resisting because they feel that they have to present a particular kind of image for their institution. A male administrator said, well, let's be clear, we do not have rape culture on our campus, despite the numbers of sexual assaults on that particular campus. While another one, another person said, thank you for your willing, willingness to present. Colleagues feel empowered, and at the same time, they feel challenged. They feel ready to preach about the topic of violence against women and girls when, at first, they did not know how to do it. And then from congregations, uh, a, a mother said to me, I wish my daughter could have been here to hear this uh, particular sermon. And so people are encouraged. Some are resistant. Some feel a sense of gratitude. Others are empowered. Others are challenged. And many of them are reflective. And so where do we go from here? In the next slide, I believe that our next step is to question the role and relevance of theological education. Theological education that does not address gender-based violence, it should be questioned and critiqued. We cannot continue to send students to institutions where they are not learning about gender-based violence. And then for them to go and be in communities where women and girls are the majority. And when women and girls are not the majority, the issue of gender-based violence still touches every person in the community. And so again, I say that theological education should teach students and leaders to move beyond the comfortable, easy, and predictable places. And so how do we do that? We need to teach our students how to reflect, for them to explore and understand the complexity of violence, and for them to also explore their own experiences. Oftentimes, ministers do not have a chance to talk about the challenges that they are facing. Ministers hold so much inside that they cannot always share with other people. But we need to create spaces where they can reflect, and at the same time, to be able to be mindful of their personal bias and how it impacts um, actions. Another piece of that is to recognize and be able to identify the texts that deal directly with violence. Oftentimes, theological education, students are given so much to read and to examine, and they And these texts, they're not comfortable, but they are necessary. So we need to be able to read them, critique them, meditate upon them, analyze them, memorize them, question them again and again and again, because the work does not happen just one time. This is ongoing work. Preaching one sermon about violence against women and girls is not enough. It is something that is ongoing. And the third piece that I would offer as a next step is, to, is for us to be able to risk, responsibly risk, this idea and this notion of preaching, for us to be able to preach from texts that deal directly with violence. And to that extent, I would say that we must preach boldly, we must preach truthfully, we must preach lovingly, and we must preach faithfully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And now we want to hear from uh, Mary Hunt. Mary Hunt is a feminist theologian and co-founder and co-director of the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, uh, WATER, based in Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, Mary has been 
uh, active in the women's church movement and the Catholic Church for many years. And she has written prolifically and lectures frequently on theology, ethics, with particular attention to social justice. She received her PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and has published wide, widely, including uh, most recently co-editing The New Feminist Christianity, Many Voices, Many Views. And uh, so Mary, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Marie, and thanks for inviting me. I want to thank uh, Sarah as well for great staff work at the Faith Trust Institute, which is the go-to place for these issues. And I particularly want to thank Lisa and Elizabeth uh, for the marvelous presentations that they've already made. You've really set this up nicely, I think, for our discussion. I want to turn first to why this is an important issue to address in theological education and say that my work is both as an adjunct uh, professor in theological education and primarily at Water, the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, where we have interns who come from theological education. So that's really the context in which I will uh, ground my remarks. My answer to that question is very simple. This is important because people are being hurt, especially women are being hurt, and ministry involves stopping, preventing, and eradicating violence. And I think those simple truths are what guide us as we do the work we do. In feminist liberation theology, we say that the starting point is always in women's experience, and that means women's experience is of violence in its many and varied forms. Violence, I think, is the most common issue that women share. Um, questions of essentialism around being female, I think, can pretty much be summed up with the question of who experiences violence, physical, psychological, spiritual. The forms may vary, but in fact, what we do is build on women's experience of violence and try to eradicate it. I think also in feminist theology, we're trying to get to the big picture. We're trying to understand, for example, why a man can harass a woman on a bus. Well, one reason he can do it is because the Bible, quote unquote, says so. That's bad theology, but it also says that women are subordinate to men, according to some interpretations. That women are derived from men. Again, bad theology, but happy for us to know in the academy. But what about most people who read the Bible and take it on face value? We also see that many religions, and I would particularly uh, single out my own Catholic tradition, treat women badly, treat women as second-class citizens. This, too, is a subtle kind of invitation to violence. And then there's the hierarchical dualisms that are women, the humans reign over animals. Let's face it, God is male. And this is the common gum chewing assumption. And I think it's the assumption of most people with whom we minister. I say that with great uh, regret after 40 years of working to change that. But I think that really still maintains itself as a normative way of thinking. We also have uh, to look at relationships of gender-based violence and heterosexism. And I think this is an important new area that has been emerging, that there are changing understandings of gender identity and of sexual orientation, but there's the unchanging reality of violence. For example, trans women all, all often experience violence, both as trans persons and as women. So just because our understandings of sexual orientation and gender identity are changing, even if we're opening up on some of those questions, we still see this constant violence. And I think that as theologians and as those who are working in theological education, we need to look not simply at the courses we offer, but at the kind of preaching and the kinds of um, adjunct groups like ours, uh, the kind of work that we do. As a Roman Catholic, I had absolutely no training in any form of violence in my theological education. But I take special responsibility for the Roman Catholic gender-based violence, especially given the pervasive nature of clergy sexual abuse and Episcopal cover-up. I just got off a phone call about an hour ago with the Women's Church Convergence, which is the progressive feminists in the Catholic community, and we remarked on the dearth of responses, Catholic responses, to the Rice case and others, and we pledged to begin to think about that in a new way. Let's move to the next slide. Responses to this work, I think, uh, can be summed up by saying that denial of decades ago, the denial is gradually giving way, to frank, giving way to frank admission of the extent of the problem, but there's still very little progress on eradicating the violence. I think virtually everyone I know admits the importance of this work, and everyone agrees on the need to prevent rather than to intervene. But sadly, most women continue to have, as Marie Fortune has said over and over again, 
the experience of violence or live in the fear of that experience. So this needs to be a priority. Over time, I think awareness has grown exponentially, but it's still very hard to measure incidents. Is incidence higher now of violence, or is it a re result of good reporting, or is there more violence? I, I just don't think we know this, and I think we need and cannot overemphasize the importance of research and academic thinking about this as a form of prevention, not as something separate from prevention, but as a form of prevention. Among theological students, and we get a lot of them here at Water as interns, we've had over 50 interns in our uh, time as an organization. Very, very few still come to us with a college or seminary course that has, has focused on preventing violence. So as much as Faith Trust and other groups have done this work, frankly, we're nowhere close. Many of them, many of our interns, like virtually all women, have had some experience of violence and very, very few resources for dealing with them. Without critical analysis and constructive, imaginative new options, I think gender-based violence will only continue to persist and perhaps become even a wider problem. It'll be interesting to find out in November when the Feminist Liberation Theologians Network, together with Faith Trust and others, gather in San Diego to take a look at the global trends in this regard. I'm very interested to find out how women in other forms of theological education in other parts of the world are dealing with this. Now, happily, some theological institutes have begun, and Faith Trust has really propelled some of this, I think have begun to implement programs. Many denominations have found it more efficient and more cost-effective to educate, to prevent, rather than litigate, to handle. But I think violence is like cancer. No one wants to look for what they don't want to find. Let me say that again. No one wants to look for what they don't want to find. Very frequently, our students who come to water describe experiences of violence without necessarily linking them to the big picture. So what we try to do is mention violence on the very first day of an internship. I always do it this way. I promise to pay for cab rides home without question should a woman feel the least bit uncomfortable going home at night. This is often enough to alert our colleagues that we know that violence exists, that it's OK to talk about it, and that it's part of the gestalt that we address here at Water, both as a theological question and as a pastoral concern. This does not happen in theological schools, but just as pastors will find that if they raise the question from the pulpit, they'll get responses we too find in theological education, that if we link personal experience with academic and professional analysis, we will begin to make a dent in this big problem. And that's why on the first day of every internship, I make my offer to pay cab fare for any intern who feels the least bit uncomfortable. Let me turn then to the next slide and my final comment about next steps. I think theological education needs to include anti-violence work in many forms. Let me suggest what some of them are. First, I think we have to be explicit about gender-based violence as a theological issue. It is not something extra. It is not pastoral. It's not something that we can take for granted. No work is too basic on this. Gender-based violence is a theological issue that needs to be addressed over and over and over and over again. Secondly, I think we have to offer classes, write articles, and gender conversations to explore gender-based violence in the context of these changing understandings of sex and gender. That means that as trans people challenge us to think anew about issues of gender and sexuality, we need to bring new forms of analysis to the conversation that includes gender-based violence so that all those who experience it, regardless of sex or gender, are able to have their needs heard and met. Third, I think we need to pay special attention to the racial, ethnic, colonialist, heterosexist dimensions. There are certainly myriad cases in the public arena at the very moment that can be used as teaching tools. Imagine, for example, an in-class writing assignment, a theological reflection on the Rice Elevator video. That would be a powerful discussion starter. Work, fourth, I think work on these issues can be introduced and must be introduced far earlier than tertiary education in discussions with children and young adults, uh, similar to what Elizabeth said earlier. I think we have to begin to think about not uh, simply a theological education, but religious education that includes gender-based violence and how the images and symbols that we teach our children and our young people can, in fact, be vexed and fraught in terms of their uh, relationship to violence. And finally, I want to just ask a question. Is it time to replace the wonderful Journal of Religion and Abuse that Marie and others uh, manage so well with something online that would make regular conversations articles, resources, and the like available to all of us, including conversations like this. 
Thank you very much. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, all three of you, for uh, very challenging uh, contributions to unpacking some of the implications of uh, the lack of attention in theological education and the potential for attention in theological education around gender-based violence. Um, I want to raise a question for all of us to think about for a moment. Um, and it has to do with uh, the, the fact of violence in our own lives and in our students' lives, uh, particularly in the academic setting. And uh, each of you sort of touched on uh, this. But um, I remember a few years ago having a conversation with uh, a professor in an academic setting. And she was telling me about that there had been a group of students on campus <clears throat> who had organized as survivors of incestuous abuse. And they had come together uh, for support uh, for each other. But once they went public, um, the, the response to them being public about um, being a survivor of incestuous abuse was decidedly mixed. And some of them found that in their placement process within their denominational setting for ministry, if they were open about the fact that they were a survivor and dealing with this, that they uh, experienced uh, pushback and bias against their being placed in a ministry setting. So I wonder if, if each of you might speak briefly to uh, how, how we deal with the reality that each of you have named, which is this is not an issue we're simply preparing students to go out and deal with. We're also dealing with students who are bringing those experiences with them into theological education. And uh, any experience you've had in helping folks find ways to address that. And the floor is open. This is Mary Hunt. Since I was last, I'll be first this time, um, and I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, we often suggest to people who work with us, if this kind of issue presents, that they get counseling, and um, that becomes not a condition for their employment by any means, but a very, very strong suggestion. Um, and I, I think that goes without saying, but I think it, it's important to say it here. Secondly, I think that um, the kind of conversation that we try to have and that I think other people in theological education are trying to have will normalize some of this so that the conversation which takes place among peers is um, quite different. This will take a long time to normalize this as part of conversation. And third, I think it's really critical to be honest, especially in evaluations and feedback with people, if they have massive amounts of unprocessed uh, issues around these things, to be very honest about them, about how important it is to do that work before they get into ministry where they could, um, in fact, do some harm either to themselves or to other people. And I, I think um, those three things would be my uh, starting points on this. Any other comments, and Lisa? I... Or Elizabeth? Yes. Um, I, would, I would say that, um, that within theological education, that we need to create the spaces for people to tell their stories. A lot of people do want to talk but are not sure about the implications of talking and of sharing. Similar to the university professor who wanted to be able to say that she was in an unsafe environment and was not sure of how that was going to impact her status at the university. And so theological education, we, we could do a better job of creating spaces for people to, to tell their stories. And then also on our syllabi, when we create them, uh, depending on the, the topics that we're talking about, to let people know to be gentle with themselves and to be able to take care of themselves regarding what they share and how they share it. I had a course that dealt with violence and the professor allowed for students to take yoga as a way to be able to resolve some of the issues that they may be experiencing physically and emotionally and spiritually as a result of being in this course on, on violence. And I definitely agree that a lot of these issues do need to be dealt with before we send preachers and ministers out uh, to do the work in the communities. Yeah, I also, this is Lisa, I want to um, 
affirm what uh, Elizabeth just said and also go back to what Mary said in her presentation about these being theological issues. I think that's exactly what this is about. And we have to teach how to be in conversation and how to be active listeners and what it means to have the bravery and the courage to share one's story, not because you want to be noticed for some reason, but because of it, it's hard, part of who you are, and that when you share that story, what the other or the others are doing is witnessing who you are and how you are, and that there is um, so much potential for transformation that can come just out of that presence and out of that witnessing and that can affect how someone can move forward and can not only um, think about their own healing and growth from that moment but also how it is that they will minister to someone else. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right about that, um, Lisa, in terms of the, the notion of uh, how we bring our own experiences to ministry and in the theological education setting, how we prepare students to do that. And that's why it was so disturbing to hear this from uh, the professor I mentioned earlier, that th this group of students were uh, taking the initiative to address their experiences of violence and work with those and bring those into the life as part of who they were and as part of their ministries. And at that point, what they were experiencing was um, uh, consequences, negative consequences for having done so. And that's one of the things we've got to flip. We've got to um, affirm and support each other in bringing those um, stories and experiences to the discussion because it, it opens up so much um, when, when other people hear uh, anyone in a preaching setting like Elizabeth is saying or a teaching setting um, talk about their own experience in a way that says it's okay and we need to talk about that here. Uh, and I think that will make a huge difference in terms of working with students. Let, let me encourage any of you who are with us to please make comments or, or questions uh, in the chat box and we would love to hear from you and see what you're thinking about as well. I, I have another uh, thought to ask you all to address. Um, basically, I think each of you have uh, commented on the importance of how we deal with sacred text in our various traditions as part of the challenge of addressing gender-based violence. I was in a workshop, uh, had a woman come up to me at the end and, and say that one of the things that really disturbed her, um, she was a Protestant woman and she said, there's so many stories of violence against women in scripture and they're so horrible and so horrific in their description. And she said, it's just too painful. Uh, don't you think it would be a good idea to just take those texts out of Scripture? They shouldn't be there. And I thought about it for a moment. And so uh, I, I want to hear from uh, each of you what you would have said to her in that instance. How would you have responded to her? Um, Lisa, would you, would you start? <laughs> sure. Um. I had that conversation, actually, a similar conversation with a student not so long ago who had um, experienced something similar and came to me and said, I cannot imagine teaching these texts and I think we should just stop talking about them. We should mm -hmm. ignore them. Um, and our, uh, our conversation revolved around the way in which we can transform core messages and stories of our tradition. Um, similar to the way we um, transform personal experiences and in many ways those stories of our tradition, they are our narrative. 
Mm -hmm. They're part of our history. We carry them from generation to generation. So it's very similar to something that could happen to us or that happened to our mother or happened to our, our grandmother. And, and we can't just cut that story off because when we do that, we, it's like cutting out a piece. It's like cutting out your heart. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't, we can't. We really can't cut out our heart. We have to find ways to open our hearts um, and to think about how how we can hold what is painful by building a language and a support community to engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that it is about the affirmation that we gain from others in addressing things together. It's the project of working through, of mm -hmm. saying, yeah, this this heart, I can never imagine this much pain, but I'm not alone. I share, it's my story, but I share this story with other people, and now we're going to all figure out how to hold it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, would you comment? Yes. Yes, thank you. The, to that, I would, I would say that uh, if, we, if we were to take out these violent texts, we would not be left with much in the, the scriptures and other sacred texts because the crucifixion is violent. I mean, there are so many examples of violence throughout the, the Bible, uh, for example, and, and if we take them out, we don't have much that is there then for us to, to preach about or to, to talk about. That's, that's one piece of it. And, but another thing for us to recognize is that violence is, is so varied it's it's not always the the violence that is is so overt that we see there are many kinds of violence there's the name calling there's different kinds of abuse there's so much of that and that is also throughout the bible but we need those scriptures we need those texts because they are they reflect what not only happened in the past but what continues to happen today in the present when we look at some of these examples of uh, the, the 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 woman in in, in judges who was uh, beaten, abused, raped, left for dead, her body cut into pieces. Those things are happening today, somewhere around the world in different places. And so our sacred texts, they do reflect much of what happens today, and we need to be able to discuss them. And that is one of the reasons why earlier in the Next step section, I mentioned that a lot of the texts when, that deal directly with violence, they will not be comfortable. They will, feel, they will not feel comfortable, but they are necessary. Mm -hmm. And they don't feel comfortable because they are violent. Uh, by mm -hmm. the very nature is that we do not feel comfortable with violence. And it's good when somebody says, I don't like these texts, because that opens up the conversation for more things to take place and say, maybe we can preach about it. Maybe we can have a conversation about it. Maybe this can lead to a, a Bible study. What kinds of things would you want us to do instead? So I think it opens up an opportunity for more conversation uh, to take place. Exactly. Excellent. And Mary, do you have any thoughts? Well, these are the kinds of questions I leave to biblical scholars who are, are more sophisticated than myself in these things. But I, I think there are two <laughs> um, main approaches that feminist theologians have taken. <laughs> One is that not all texts are sacred. Not everything we call sacred text is really sacred. And I think that's an important invitation to people to look critically at what we mean by sacred text. Another one is to say, and this, that was the first one has been Elizabeth Schuster of Fiorenza in some ways, and second, Rosemary Ruther has said that the well-being of women is the ultimate criterion for whether a text ought to be canonical or not. So um, right off the bat, I think those two Catholic biblical, uh, biblically informed feminist scholars have given us some clues on how to handle the materials. My own view would be to say that as we study and contextualize these things uh, in the way that post-colonial biblical uh, scholars are teaching us, we're learning to use the stories very much, um, as Elizabeth just said, as ways to talk about today. And I think about, for example, the, the very creative Lady Parts book um, that was done a la vagina monologues, looking at some of those texts and really um, allowing, inviting women students and women professors to write their own um, exegesis of these texts according to today's uh, mores. And I think, again, using vagina monologues as an example, that's a wonderful teaching tool for how to take texts that are on the face of them really very problematic for, in terms of women and violence and turn them into something, uh, turn them into a platform for saying some other things. And that, as religion is a dynamic activity, I think is that's very much a part of what we ought to be doing. 
I totally agree. And uh, one of the things that for me is important about the material that we find in um, the canon or, or whatever texts that we refer to in our traditions is those stories are telling the truth about women's experience. And as, as each of you have said, they're painful, they're difficult, they're challenging. But telling the truth is the first step towards any process of justice making or healing for someone who has suffered abuse or someone who has perpetrated abuse and for the wider community. And so that's one of the places that um, I think it's absolutely critical that we retain those, which uh, we obviously will, but also engage them, as each of you have said. And in the context of what do we learn from those texts about our own experiences today and about what we want to suggest as normative in uh, our faith communities. So uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done there, but a lot of, uh, I think, potential. Um, so we have a few questions here quickly before we conclude. Um, one is, how do we get colleagues on board around discussion of these issues? Uh, Lisa, would, any particular suggestions? Um, I, I think we just need to be persistent and get in there and continue to engage our colleagues in conversation, um, share stories that will resonate with them. You know, we never know when something's going to sink in because as, as we began saying, you know, people can say this, this is not going on, clergy can say it's not happening in my community, but it, it's not true. When we say mm -hmm. that, our, we're closing our eyes. So we just we need to keep getting in there and raising up, um, raising up the issues, putting the language out there, and just continuing to remind everyone this is real, and we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Good, Elizabeth, your thoughts? Yes, I, thank you. I I think that one of the the ways that we can do it is just through the ordinary everyday conversations that we have to be able to know our colleagues and to be able to know the communities in which we work and the more that we do that the more people will talk with us and share their stories and the more we will be able to do the same and I think a lot of conversation does not happen because we do not know each other we do everyone is so busy working on whatever they're working on that people do not always take the time to learn other people's stories and it's, it's different working alongside someone you know and someone whose story you know and I think also another simple way that we can we can do it is is to have communities where we actually have signs that that say if you are in such a such a situation here are some numbers that you can call when people see those kinds of things posted around in bathrooms and hallways etc it at least sends a message that this community cares about violence and we care about your situation uh, with it and then lastly, I would say for us to challenge each other to be able to think differently about the texts uh, that we read and the texts that we engage and not just think of them the same way all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can definitely be creative in the way we approach those texts. And Mary, any closing thoughts around getting our colleagues involved? Well, I believe in rewards. Um, I think our colleagues need to be rewarded for this kind of work. And publication is a certain kind of reward for scholars. Um, I think we need to invite people to publish on this topic. I need, think we need to lift the profile so that it's as important to uh, be dealing with these questions, both in ethics and theology, as it is to be dealing with certain issues in church history and biblical studies, but to really lift the profile of this um, as best we can. And then I think for students, it's really important, since what they want are grades and credit, that we reward them by inviting them to do projects that deal with anti-violence work as part of uh, the regular curriculum so that whatever course they're taking they could do a project or a paper or uh, a comprehensive exam or a dissertation on these issues so that they would get grades and credit the things that they want and um, find this rewarding work not simply uh, adjunct extra something mm -hmm. uh, to be done when everything else is finished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'd like to conclude our conversation. Uh, thank you um, for that. And go back to something Lisa said at the very beginning. You used the phrase embedded strategically. And I think that's critical to um, what all of us have been saying. Because we haven't had time to talk about, but we might have talked about, um, the political realities in the academy of uh, addressing these issues. And my observation uh, over the years is that it's often been um, junior faculty who have wanted to teach in this area, but have had to weigh the risk of teaching in this area and then not be rewarded, Mary, to, to your point, uh, but in fact punished for um, you know, it, supposedly teaching in an area that either wasn't important or wasn't you know, real theology or whatever the excuse was for not wanting the person to teach in that area. But I, the thing I'm seeing now is that uh, among the, the people that I'm uh, in contact with who are teaching in this area, is there are more and more senior faculty. And I think that's really encouraging because um, we need people who are in positions in the academy to be in leadership and uh, to be tenured and, and not have to worry about um, what the, the institution is going to do with this particular area of work for them. And so I want to affirm that and, and support um, uh, faculty as they are considering how they want to approach this and how they want to, their friend, their colleagues to also be engaged in it. Um, finally, for those of you who are with us today who are members of the American Academy of Religion and are planning to attend uh, the AR session this November in San Diego, just a heads up that uh, we will be doing uh, two events. Uh, Mary, would you briefly explain the Feminist Liberation Theology Network? Yes, thank you. The Feminist Liberation Theologians Network is a gathering of people from around the world. They're usually between 50 and 75 people. We gather on Friday afternoon. It will be on November 21st from 4 to 6 p.m. in San Diego, California as part of the American Academy of Religion Society of Biblical Literature meeting. It will be in the Marriott Marquis uh, Hotel uh, and Marriott Marquis and Marina Hotel and at the Catalina Room, if anyone needs that, we can send that out with the notes from this. Um, but the point is that everyone's welcome. We will have speakers, including some of those here present, uh, and others from different parts of the world, and we'll have a lot of conversation about how this is working, uh, how, how other people are doing this, and begin to get some of that data that I talked about needing. And then, Marie, on Saturday morning? Yes, the, the Women's Caucus of the AAR will also be doing a session on addressing gender-based violence in theological education. So that will be another opportunity to engage uh, with colleagues around these issues. So if any of you are planning to be at AAR, please come and join us and contribute. Uh, we want to know what you're doing, how it's going, and how we can support each other in continuing to do this work in the theological education. Thank you to each of my colleagues uh, and dear friends, uh, Lisa Gelber, uh, Elizabeth Okundi, and Mary Hunt. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your energy in uh, joining in this conversation, and hope to see you soon. And, and us. Thanks again, everyone, and thanks to the In Faith Community Foundation for sponsoring this webinar. I'll email the present presentation slides to all of you this afternoon. When you close the webinar window in a few moments, you'll be prompted to fill out a short survey. Please take a moment to complete it and give us your feedback about this webinar and any ideas or suggestions for future webinars. You can view all of our upcoming webinars online at faithtrustinstitute.org. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you for joining us.